Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you for joining everyone. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get going here in about a minute. I'm just gonna allow some time so that people can log in and, and get settled. Um, as we as we kind of wait for that to happen, um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items on our side. Uh, the first one being is uh, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be made available uh, in, the, in the next couple of days um, after after we're finished recording here today. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, obviously, all, all the attendees on today's webinar are going to be on mute. However, you will still have an opportunity uh, to submit comments and questions um, along the Q&A box that's, that's available at the bottom of your screen. So as we're going through, if there's anything that, any questions that pop up, any comments that you would like us to expand on, please please include that uh, and we'll be able to uh, hopefully get to a couple of them at, at the end of the call. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds here. Okay. All right, cool. Great, all right, uh, well, on that note, um, you know, Lizzie, Carolyn, thank you both for, for joining us here today and, and welcome uh, everybody again to, to joining the webinar. Um, uh, to, to help get us started, we're gonna start with some, some brief introductions. Uh, my name is Peter Barra, and I'm on the product solutions team here at Imperity uh, with a focus on ad tech. Uh, I've worked within the ad tech industry for the past 10 plus years uh, across business development and, and data science and ana analytics roles, really just focusing on, on using audience data for, for paid media activation. Uh, I joined Imperity about a year ago um, after, after eight years at a digital audience solutions company called Distillery. Uh, in addition to, you know, to, to paid media, I also uh, lead some of our efforts around, on our clean rooms and retail media, and obviously get to, to have conversations like the ones we're gonna have today with our partners uh, at Spark Group and Tenuti. Um, so you know, today we're, we're joined by Lizzie Kiefer, Senior Manager, Paid Social at Tenuity, uh, and Carolyn Anderson, Group Vice President of Digital Marketing and CRM at the Spark Group. Thank you again uh, for both of you for joining us. Um, you know, uh, Carolyn, I'll, I'll pass it off to you to, to give a brief intro. Great, uh, thanks Peter for having me today. Um, I'm really looking forward to discussing all things first party data with you and Lizzie. Uh, so for those that don't know, Spark Group is a joint venture between Simon Property Group and Authentic Brands Group. We, we operate seven brands in the US market and they include Aeropostale, Nautica, Lucky Brand, Brooks Brothers, Eddie Bauer, Forever 21 and Reebok. And I joined the company through Lucky Brand in May of 2020, where I was leading e-commerce and growth. And I transitioned into my new role to head up digital marketing and CRM across the portfolio of brands in January of 2021. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and Lizzie, if you could give an intro uh, on your side as well. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. I'm really excited to be here today with you both. Um, in my role at Tenuity, I oversee the paid social program specifically for the par Spark portfolio and working closely with each of those brands to define those strategic opportunities um, on existing and emerging paid social platforms. And then of course, working really closely with Amparity and Carolyn to, to leverage that first party data um, to really enhance our audiences across paid social. Fantastic. All right, uh, thank you both for that. Um, again, kind of before we start jumping into to the good stuff and I get to hand it over to the experts, um, you know, for those of you who are, who are tuning in and are not familiar with Imperity, we are a customer data platform and we help leading enterprise brands such as T-Mobile, Alaska Airlines, Dick's Sporting Goods, and of course the Spark Group, uh, better know and engage their customers um, through experiences powered by their first party data. Uh, you know, if you joined us last month for our first discussion on, on, the, uh, on the economics of, of your first party data, uh, we had a conversation around the importance of building a first party data foundation uh, as, you know, as brands are starting to face some of the, some of the industry changes around cookie deprecation, um, changes to the privacy regulations, uh, and really just the ever, complex, ever growing complexity of the ad tech industry. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, the previous webinar, please do, but by no means do you need to watch that before joining us here today. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, you know, Carolyn, I'm going to start with you, right? Uh, you know, as, you, as you're kind of thinking through customer data platforms, Spark Group has a fairly unique first-party data challenge and, and opportunity. You mentioned that you work across a portfolio of brands, uh, which means that your teams are at various stages of their first-party activation journey. Uh, can you talk us through like how the organization is thinking about standardizing some of those practices with first-party data, and what were you really hoping to, to unlock by working with a customer data platform? Uh, and imperity. Sure. Um, so as I shared earlier, Spark Group operates seven brands, um, and they're all at various levels of maturity on their first, start, first party data activa activation journey. 
Uh, prior to partnering with Imperity, we approached sharing audiences with our media partners by either manually uploading CRM lists to those platforms or utilizing connections available through our email service providers. And finally, some brands were leveraging a DMP. The real challenge with these approaches vary. Manual audiences require manual effort from your data or your CRM teams and manual refreshes to keep those audiences actually updated. And in addition, when we think about the other tools that we have, they're very limited in scope with the data available within those ecosystems to generate those audiences. So in contrast, since we've been working with Imperity, we've been able to bring together and unify all of our data. So it has online data, offline data, browsing data, engagement data, um, and more. And in addition, Imperity already has models that will help us to quickly generate more sophisticated audiences that combine many of these signals that can help us to achieve better performance results. So the unified customer view and the ease of the tool and the automated connections to our media partners help us to focus on our strategy and driving performance versus spending time on process and operations so that we can actually leverage the audience data at scale. Love that. I'm excited to kind of, obviously, we're going to dig into some examples of the way that that unification has really unlocked some things uh, for, for the Spark Group. Um, you know, Lizzie, from, the, from that agency perspective, right, if, if we're looking last month, the IAB released their, their updated state of data report talking about all the new types of audiences that are, are available uh, for, for paid media teams, um, whether that's, you know, obviously using some of the first party data that we're going to talk about, but there's contextual, there's interest based. Uh, there's obviously the seller and platform defined segments that are available now, and then your traditional third party data offerings. Um, in this world where that's changing and, and understanding the effectiveness is changing as, as all those market dynamics are, are evolving, uh, can you evaluate, like, how do you think about that? How do you evaluate what, what to use and where um, in order to like, drive the goals that, that you're working to achieve on behalf of your, on behalf of your clients? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, blanket statement, for your brand to figure out what works, it definitely involves some level of testing, whether it's testing first-party data and third-party third data, broad targeting, et cetera. Um, but just a note, best in class, we really, really recommend testing into first-party data. So with third-party data, it typically involves signals from the platform to define those interests or lifestyle attributes. And you know, it might be a little bit more opaque because these aren't actually your customers who have purchased from your brand. On the other hand, first-party data is that information that brands like Spark Group uh, collect about each of their own customers. So say I purchased um, from one of the brands four times, they would know that about a customer like me, making it easier to either find customers who look like me or re-engage me to make that those um, higher lifetime value purchasers. So that's where it becomes really, really valuable in a paid media strategy. And the reason that this became so much more important over the last couple of years was due to those um, Apple iOS updates in 2021. Uh, pr prior to that, we were a lot more reliant on those pixel-based audiences to re-engage and retarget our customers and potential customers. So we did all of that based off of pixels and online tracking and things like that. With the deprecation um, of those, uh, those signals, uh, the ad ecosystem has evolved a lot. Um, and a lot of it is to limit tracking, which requires us to pivot our audience strategy as well. So without that, um, you know, some of those audience updates, it's harder to reach people who've expressed interest in your brand and deliver those ads that feel the most relevant and useful for those customers. So from the agency perspective, we're really seeing that first party data is such a fantastic way to increase that relevance and assist in acquiring uh, and retaining new customers in every level of the funnel from awareness to lower funnel. Yeah, I know uh, as a person, obviously, as I mentioned, I, I've worked with an ad tech and, and seeing like these changes that can just kind of literally happen overnight. Like you talked about iOS and, uh, you know, I think that, that the agility that you're able to kind of talk about there is gonna be increasingly important because, you know, there's gonna be more changes like that, whether hopefully it's not as abrupt as the one that Apple did, but there will be others that come along. Um, and obviously as that happens, uh, you know, we I think we agree first party day is gonna have a role to play, you know, so Carolyn, you, you talked about the unification of that, that that data foundation. You've been able to you know take away some of the the time and the focus on like just organizing it, and now you can start to really dig into the values and unlock it. Like, what are some of the the segmentation capabilities, whether it's like a predictive one or identifying high value high value customers, um, that you've been you've, you've been able to unlock with Imperity through that unified view of your of your first party data assets? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned before, Imperity uniquely allows us to bring together even more data sources into a single environment where we can build more sophisticated and informed audiences that we can test and learn across our media campaigns in partnership with our media partners. Um, we've actually seen a lot of success in our high predictive CLV audiences. So a high predictive CLV audience is built by looking at our historical data and then compiling an audience of our high potential customers for us to drive marketing campaigns to. This tactic is intended to improve ROAS uh, by reducing media waste on low potential shoppers. And these audiences have actually generated 5X ROAS compared to our prior, prior strategies. So we really saw a performance improvement leveraging those audiences. Um, in addition to that, we're just starting to test into lookalikes uh, using our imparity generated audiences for acquisition. Uh, and we hope to see similar improvements in those results compared to our approaches that we used previously. Yeah, and to expand on what Carolyn mentioned, uh, with one of our brands, we tested a clothing category segment. It was really top performing over the summer, although it did have a smaller scale um, due to the specificity of the products. So to iterate on that, um, with the category segment that we know already proved out really strong return for us, the next step then is to leverage that segment as a lookalike audience. So that will bring us the scale um, to finding those new qualified prospecting audiences just because we have that confidence that the, this segment already produced such a strong return for us. And then lastly, um, just a note about uh, another key factor in a, in a strong acquisition strategy, just ensuring that your purchaser exclusions are up to date. So with those regularly refreshed audiences that we're able to achieve through a connection like Amparity, uh, we have complete confidence that we're excluding new and existing buyers from our prospecting campaigns and reaching those only net new potential customers just due to the way that we're able to make that connection and have that constant refresh. Yeah, I, I know, you know, we're talking a lot about, about the data quality here, right? But then there's the aspect of how do we feed that into the downstream systems to ensure that you're doing that spending your media dollars efficiently and effectively um and i think that you know as we're if, as we're able to kind of like do those 24-hour refreshes of that data with the latest transaction and the latest behavioral that the kellen you've talked about quickly feeding that into the end destinations for the look like models and, and other opportunities um becomes important right like doing that at speed is going to be increasingly important uh moving ahead uh, you know, you know, Lizzie, I like to kind of like build off of, of what you just said there, like with the, we talked a little bit about the predictive, some of the product affinity um, that you mentioned and suppression, like, are there other areas of opportunity that you're kind of looking at where you're able to like kind of look into the past a little bit more uh, of, as we see like various holiday seasons or back to school seasons come up? Are there opportunities that you're seeing on the agency side as well to like tap into to that uh, on the foundation that the Carolyn and the team has built? Yeah, absolutely. So as we've already kind of talked about, um, Spark has been able to make more strategic recommendations and decisions based off of kind of the control and confidence we have in this audience strategy. So, um, you know, we're just beginning to tap into even further testing, but beyond just that, um, we really have the ability to test into these seasonal nuances. Um, and this is of course really exciting when you're working in retail and each brand has such a different peak period, whether it's back mm -hmm. to school or hol holiday or potentially Mother's Day or whatever it might be. Um, with that, we have the opportunity to, for example, um, take a list of holiday purchasers from 2021. We can either re-engage these customers thinking that maybe they're kind of a once a year purchaser, they really only show up for that holiday gifting purchase. Um, but knowing that we have such a peak period at this time, it's also a really great list um, to create a qualified lookalike to acquire those new users who look like these qualified buyers from the previous year. So can do the same thing for a back to school period or whatever is really, really relevant to your brand. And as we kind of learn and mature, we do have the ability as well to create these more advanced targeting strategies, retaining customers, increase LTV, um, and even potentially testing out these cross sell and upsell strategies based on um, categorical purchases from these different retail brands. Yeah, and it's a really good point that Lizzie brings up. We've gotten better and better at strategizing and determining where we focus based on where the biggest opportunities are. And we collaborate extensively with all of our media partners, our agency partners, and the Imperity team to make sure that we're collaborating on all of those strategies. Um, historical and holiday audiences are an area that we're testing into. And early on in our Imperity implementation process for all of our brands, we determine how we can immediately unlock value as soon as the platform is live. And our paid strategy audiences are actually at the top of our list for those strategies that we activate first. Um, as we head into the holiday season, we're thinking a lot about past holiday purchasers. 
or winter product affinity audiences like outerwear or sweaters, for example. And we've also been testing out strategies on one brand, analyzing those results, and then scaling those best practices across all of our brands if it was successful. Yeah, you know, Kelly, like, I, I, I really like that, um, that you're talking about that, especially, again, where the position that you sit within a portfolio of brands. Like, that's where I think, you know, when we talked about that first party kind of like initial challenge, but that really is an opportunity uh, for you all to kind of like test and learn across different things and do it at the same time because you've got the portfolio of brands to work with. Uh, and I know like I, I'm interested to see like what holiday shopping segments I start getting targeted with because I know I only buy certain brands just because, you know, that's what my wife likes or my my family. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to kind of see that, uh, see that expand and see if, um, you know, as that data kind of gets fed into these systems like that, that gets smarter and they know that I'm going to be a certain type of customer that does have value, but it has value at various points of this of, of the year. Right. Um, cool. So like, you know, you know, kind of like continuing on that, uh, Lizzie, I like to loom, uh, zoom out a bit. You talked a little bit about potentially testing new audience strategies, um, you know, where we touched on the increasing complexity of the, of the paid media ecosystem. There's going to be new hauled gardens, it feels like, popping up all the time. Um, as, as a leader on the, on the paid social team, you're obviously um, looking for innovative new ways to, to reach Spark's target customers or potential new customers. Um, as these things come to market, you know, whether it's a, a Roku or a TikTok or a retail media network, whatever it may be, uh, what, what role do you feel audience, da uh, uh, audience data can play? And how are you thinking about like, you know, evaluating them uh, as, as, like a, as that social lead? Yeah, absolutely. So it's definitely become a priority for us to diversify our channel mix, especially with all of these new and emerging platforms. We definitely want to diversify that media spend, and that really requires us to test across different audience and creative strategies to figure out what works for that specific platform and that specific brand. So with that, each platform is at a different stage and offering a different range of interest, um, you know, based on the typical platform demographics, but then also behavioral targeting, how users are interacting with the platform and what can be effective. So one of our best practices with that is always incorporating first party data within your media strategy when it's available, um, whether it's from an acquisition a retention or a suppression perspective, even if you're doing something as simple as excluding current customers and making sure that's mostly up to date. That's absolutely something we'd recommend. And this is where Spark's first party data plays a really significant role in lookalike audiences, regardless of the channel. In many cases, we've seen our first party data lookalike audiences outperform in platform targeting opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, we really see the seed list, so kind of like that original first party data list. Um, when we model that into lookalike audiences, we see that perform best with high quality data, such as those, you know, holiday 2021 past holiday shoppers um, or these predictive high value customers. And it can be really difficult for brands to kind of nail down what is that high value customer. Um, it's different for each brand. It's definitely not a one size fits all. Um, but, you know, working with a, a data partner such as Amparity, uh, we are really confident that we can reach the right audience just due to that modeling and the different ways we partner together to really nail that down. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And, you know, as as I've been having like various conversations um, within within the industry, like, you know, the more that these platforms come up, like obviously that's going to represent new options, more more areas to potentially target customers. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how like those platforms try to like prove that they're not just going to reach, you know, let's say the billion of users they have, but the right users that are going to be relevant. Who can do that intelligence quicker? Who can do who can bring that value quicker to their partners? Um, you know, I know that being able to kind of like collaborate with with some of those platforms has, has maybe let's say traditionally been a little bit harder to do. But as this competition increases, I, I want to see what that collaboration opportunity unlocks because there's going to be more areas for as as you mentioned, like how do we use data? How can we show that we're finding the right consumers at the right time? Um, it's going to be interesting to see that dynamic play out as as there's more of these kind of like first party based walled garden uh, ecosystems. Cool. Um, well, as we're kind of starting to, to wind down here a bit, uh, we'd love to kind of obviously come back to both of you and say, what, you know, some of the, what are some of the, like, the key learnings and, and best practices uh, that you've gained around some of the, the paid strategies and testing that, Lizzie, you've talked about, uh, the audience's activations and, and the data foundation, Carolyn. Um, you know, so on, on that, like, what, what are strategies that you have you employed where you've kind of tested and learned on both customer acquisition and retention? Uh, and then, like, you know, Thinking, thinking beyond that, what are you excited about next? What are, what are some of the areas that you're looking to build into heading into 2023? Yeah, so in terms of uh, learnings and best practices, we have learned a lot. We've definitely tested a lot. 
Um, and I think the first one that comes to mind is that, you know, being able to build audiences that are informed by all of our disparate data sources and using Imperity's connector to sync those audiences to our media platforms has really allowed us to shift our focus on our strategy and results. And that allows us to move fast, test, learn, and drive growth, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, it also brings to mind like collaboration. So number two would be like collaboration with all of our partners has been absolutely critical to our success. We've learned a ton from everyone we work with, and I think that they've all learned a ton from each other. We intentionally involve our media agency, our Imperity partners, and our media platform partners to develop these strategies. And we also work together to establish how are we going to measure success to make sure that we're all on the same page on what's working, what's not working, and then what are we going to do next? And um, finally, I think you just touched on this with Lizzie, but we really are interested in diversifying our media strategy and leveraging first party data audiences within those platforms allows us to invest more intelligently and purposefully. So based on the performance improvement we've seen on existing platforms, when we use the data, we're super confident that starting off with our audience strategy with these newer platforms will ensure that we can maximize performance and minimize waste and, and make it easier for us to try new things. Totally. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Carolyn mentioned. Um, I'll just wrap it up with a couple recommendations and, and a plus one to what you already said there. Um, but from an acquisition perspective, um, recommendations, best practices, definitely want to ensure that you're suppressing those existing customers from your campaigns. So you're sure that when you're acquiring new customers, you know that that's a net new person to your business. Additionally, leveraging those key segments or top performing existing customer lists for lookalike expansion. So as we mentioned, kind of like that top performing category, we saw this specific category list do really, really well for us. Figuring out what seed lists are really important to your business and then creating those lookalikes so you can go out and find customers who look like the people who are already successful for you. And then within retention, um, this requires definitely identifying goals per brand. So for example, if you know that it's really important to re-engage someone in the first 60 days after they purchased, using that as a targetable segment if the, if the list size is there for you, um, or you know that might be different or might be important for your business to uh, re-engage lapsed buyers who haven't purchased in a year, especially during those seasonal moments like Christmas, knowing that you know they might be purchasing during a holiday period and, and re-engaging those lapsed buyers. So definitely discuss with you, all of those partners that Carolyn mentioned, your media agency, people on your internal teams to identify where people are dropping off and building those audience kind of segments that are built to ladder up into your specific business goals. That's 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 fantastic. Thank you both for for offering those uh, kind of best practices and learnings as, as we wrap up here. And I think, you know, we we touched on like the, the all the new audience offerings that are coming into place with with cookie deprecation and privacy, and I think you know as we kind of evaluate that uh, from like a macro level perspective, it's really figuring out what role does like where can first party data start to supplement what was traditionally done? Where can like you mentioned lookalikes? We've talked about retention and suppressions and holidays, but like it's really expanding on the use cases that first party data has been able that hasn't like, has been difficult to do with customer data before, right? And I think. As we look at 2023, I know one of the things that I, I'm excited about is to, to see where that innovation lies. And I know, um, you know, obviously, uh, Carolyn, within the Spark Group, you're going to be able to do that across brands and, and agencies like uh, Tenuti at the agency side, you're on the forefront of that. You're always testing, you're always out there learning and, and doing that. And so it kind of excited to see what the 12 months will bring there. Um, I want to thank you both again for, for joining us uh, today and, and being able to offer your expertise. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'll keep talking for a little bit. That way our, our, our listeners here can start to throw in some more questions. Um, but we'll, we'll start to turn it over there. Um, so as we, as we kind of like look at the first couple of you coming in, uh, as we all know, Google announced again that they, they've kind of pushed back the third-party deprecation in Chrome uh, for at least another two years, uh, 2024, loosely, whenever that means. Um, so, you know, is this similar to like, you know, maybe what I'll speak for myself. When I was like in school, like, oh, that means I can I can wait a little bit. I don't have to do all the work right away. Uh, is that what that means here? Or, or you know, Liz, you talked a lot about that testing. Like, is that something that, that people should lean into now? Or is it, can they kind of take a backseat for a little bit? Yeah, in short, I would say definitely you'll want to address this now. Um, save the panic for later, for sure. Um, but I think brands overall with that first party data strategy, if you're getting it in a good spot, you will be in a strong position to take on this loss of cookies when it happens. Um, I think overall, 
continuing to work with your data partners, et cetera, to figure out those ways to improve the data connectivity, to improve those match rates. So something that we're seeing is, you know, when um, cookies are deprecated or for example, iOS 14.5, we did take a hit to uh, match rates based on, um, you know, our customers finding their profiles in Facebook or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, they rolled out different technologies such, a, such as a conversions API to address that so we can better match those users back. So staying abreast of all of these different tech updates that will be rolling out is a really important way um, to stay on top of this and combat it. But it's absolutely something that all brands should be discussing, whether they're agency partners or their tech partners, um, to figure out how to um, address this in the best way that fits for your brand. But definitely first party data strategy layers up nicely into this. Um, and refining that strategy before this hits, whether it's the next two years or whenever it might be. Yes, or whenever someone just decides to make a separate decision. Uh, cool, so uh, looking through here, um, all right, uh, obviously, you know, Carolyn, you talked a lot about the first party data foundation. Um, you know, in your view, it seems like, uh, is, a, is a customer data platform really necessary to, to extract the most value out of, out of the first party data assets that you have? Yeah, I think um, so prior to our investment in having a CDP on these brands, we were able to test some of our ideas around first party data. But in order to test those ideas, it took a lot of time on figuring out how to connect the dots um, from like analyzing the data, developing an insight, defining the strategy, and then figuring out how do we activate and then how do we measure that strategy. So our investment in our CDP just makes that whole process a lot smoother and easier and faster, and it streamlines the more operational and process aspects, which help us to focus on the opportunity versus figuring out how do we even get started. Um, so in that way, I think it's been extremely valuable, but I think you can absolutely get started with that one and try to figure out like, what are your hypotheses and what do you wanna test? Um, with having a CDP, we have, you know, there's a few critical items about that. That unified customer view, we didn't have that before. It's all separate. Every, all the data was segregated. Um, our ability to analyze and make decisions about audiences so that we're making sure that we're spending money wisely on our paid channels and that we're targeting in, intelligently and intentionally in our CRM channels. We talked a lot about paid here. We also leverage our audiences very heavily in our CRM channels. Um, mm -hmm. The direct connections to the media platforms, it's something that I forget I didn't have before until we are on board a new brand and then I realize we have to do it manually again. So that's something that really stands out as one of those things I take as a given uh, that wasn't. Um, look like modeling so that we can actually acquire people that are like our best customers. It's just made us more efficient and more thoughtful. Uh, the option to suppress our first party database during acquisition campaigns helps us decrease our media waste and focus really on growing our business. And finally, really measurement and tracking. So, you know, can we measure and track incremental lift using holdout audiences? And then those insights can help us drive campaign optimization and decisions on our future strategic approach. Um, identifying what's causing that increase in that ROAS. So we're definitely working as a team. That's probably the hardest part that we really don't have a solid grounding in yet because we're still trying to understand how to measure success and how to measure incrementality but that's something that we're allowed to focus on now because we have time freed up to actually do that awesome great uh cool um well you know uh thank you again for both for for joining me here today and, and obviously taking a little bit of the extra time to to answer some of the questions uh from the audience um as as a reminder if we didn't get into any of your questions live um please still please still submit them we, we can review them afterwards and follow up with you directly uh we'll also be sharing this recording uh in the next couple of days um and so so be sure to you know be checking your inboxes and and sharing it with all your friends and posting it on on the social channels so that we can then target you with the audience data on the other side uh, but make sure you continue to do that uh, and then um, as we as we kind of get ready to close out the year and parity will be hosting uh, our final part of the series on the economics of your messy data uh, next month so Carolyn Lizzie thank you both again for joining me here today and, and making me look smarter than than what I am uh, and I, uh, I want to thank everybody again for, for joining us and, and hope you all have a great rest of your week awesome thank you thank you